আমাদের সাথে আজকে যিনি আছেন চেয়ারপারসন হিসেবে প্রথমে সার্কিটটা আমি ইন্ট্রোডিউস করছি আমাদের আজকে চেয়ারপারসন হচ্ছে ডক্টর আলিম আক্তার ভুইয়া স্যার স্যার ইজ দ্য সিনিয়র কোঅর্ডিনেটর অফ এভার কেয়ার হসপিটাল ঢাকা ইন দ্য ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ নিউরোলজি प्रीवियसলি হুইচ ওয়াজ অ্যাপোলো হসপিটালস ঢাকা স্যার কমপ্লিটেড হিজ এমবিবিএস फ्रॉम চিটাগং মেডিকেল কলেজ লেটার হি গোট হিজ ডিপ্লোমা ইন ট্রপিক্যাল মেডিসিন এন্ড হাইজিন फ्रॉम লন্ডন ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ ট্রপিক্যাল মেডিসিন এন্ড হাইজিন এন্ড देयर আফটার স্যার ডিড হিজ পোস্ট গ্রাজুয়েশন এমডি ইন নিউরোলজি फ्रॉम ইউএসএ in the university uh, this is uh, uh, in the new york uh, city university of new york that is affiliated with the mount sinai hospital and sir was and i am proud to say that sir was awarded as the best resident in teaching there for two consecutive years later after sir did his post doctorate in epilepsy sir ramon tanondi ajke apni amader sathe eshechen dr ali bakter bhuya sir उद्बोधन thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to join bd physician i am very uh, honored to be present here today and uh, be a chair person of this session uh, today uh, our discussion will be on uh, management of uh, parkinson's disease and uh, today our speaker will be dr pravin kumar yadav so actually he is a very highly qualified knowledgeable an experienced neurologist he is from india actually in the earlier session he has discussed on clinical approach and uh, e approach and evaluation of parkinson's disease and uh, so it is a very uh, important uh, topic uh, parkinson's disease it is a progressive uh, neurodegenerative disease and it is uh, a disease which is affecting people all over the world actually even in our uh, part of the world uh, our longevity is increasing in bangladesh is, it is now 72 73 and uh, with the aging population as we are living longer uh, this disease is becoming also uh, very uh, common and uh, it affects mostly the older people in uh, late 50s 60s 70s 80s uh, but it can also affect the people who are younger which is not very uh, common uh there are uh, gene related to that uh and then uh, there are different types of parkinsonism mostly we see idiopathic parkinsonism uh, there is uh, atypical parkinsonism vascular parkinsonism parkinson's plus syndrome and uh, different types and sometimes it is a challenge uh, to uh, diagnose this uh, disease uh, and uh, there are uh, different management uh, for this disease actually most of the uh patients are managed uh, through medical management and uh, this uh, medical management it works only for certain kind of parkinsonism uh, besides uh, medical management there are other aspects surgical management there is some relation with uh, diet there is rehabilitation and other aspect uh dr yadav uh, i definitely will be highlighting on the different aspects of management so I request Dr. Yadav to start his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'm uh, extremely grateful for uh, to the BD physicians for allowing me to participate in this program. And also, I'm glad that Dr. Ali is here so that he can guide us in this topic. So I'll be basically focusing on the management of Parkinson's disease. So it will be on idiopathic Parkinson's disease. How will you approach and manage the idiopathic Parkinson's disease? and i'll give you the uh, basics of the management it will be for the physicians so uh, we'll be talking about mostly about the basic management and how to go about the patients so i'll just share my slides is it visible yes sir okay so um, we know that neurodegenerative disorders uh, there is not much option of treatment mostly in most of the neuro neurodegenerative disorders like uh, dementia alzheimer's disease frontotemporal dementia motor neuron disease 
the option of treatment is quite less but unlike that parkinson disease is one neurodegenerative disorder in which there is lot of treatment modalities and the treatment is very complicated and is depending on the stage of the disorder so the treatment of uh, parkinson disease is complex and actually it's quite complex as the duration of the disorder becomes uh, uh, longer and longer the co complications the motor complications and various motor fluctuations arises which makes the treatment become uh, very difficult so the uh, basics of the management of parkinson disease has to be clear in order to properly manage this patient in various stages of the disease which we see this patient the management of the disease can be divided into symptomatic and potential neuroprotective uh, treatment if you look at the natural course of parkinson disease which i had mentioned in the previous session also there is a pre motor stage or the prodromal stage in which you are having the four manifestations you can remember as a b c and d that is anosmia rbd is the b form rbd that is rem behavioral disorder c is constipation and d is depression so these are the prodromal stages and after that the motor uh, symptoms starts arising the motor symptoms as i already mentioned you can remember by the trap double f that is tremor rigidity akinesia postural instability and flex posture and freezing of gait so that are the main manifestations and then the patient presents to the doctor neurologist or physician the patient is diagnosed as parkinson disease and then we start the treatment after starting the treatment initially there is a very good response which we call as the honeymoon phase of the parkinson disease that is the initial 5 years and then we titrate the medications based on the requirement of the uh, uh, the patient depending on the symptoms and the response and the side effects as well and then the patient goes into the maintenance phase after the maintenance phase almost 3 to 5 years it varies from patients to patient there arises the motor complications then you get the motor fluctuations you get the on off the frequent on and off the wearing off and then the various dyskinesias then you see that the medications after receiving the medication the patient starts developing lot of chorea dystonia myoclonus and all so that is the advanced stage of parkinson disease this stage becomes very very difficult to manage there is lot of uh, mechanisms and you have to understand the basics to manage this patient it becomes quite complicated here and then it goes to the complex stage later on along with this you should remember that the uh, non motor symptoms also progress you get, you develop the cognitive problems urinary symptoms postural hypotension and finally in the complex stage you have the dementia and psychosis patients develop psychosis due to the medications and then dementia as the parkinson uh, parkinsonism uh, progresses and then the patient uh, starts developing cognitive impairment and in the motor symptoms after the motor fluctuations you develop severe falls gait disorder bulbar dysfunction and finally the patient becomes in a bed bound stage so this is the course of the parkinson disease the treatment varies the response to the medication varies according to the stage and the treatment options and the various divisions that is the surgical interventions like deep brain stimulation the newer treatment which is available the apomorphin injections etc becomes very important in the later stages of the disorder so this cartoon again depicts the various stages you can see that the non motor phases progresses from the constipation rbd etc and then it goes to the uh, minimal cognitive impairment urinary symptoms orthostatic hypotension and dementia the motor symptoms start with the tremor rigidity akinesia postural instability etc and then it starts worsening the patient develops falls postural instability worsens and dysphagia develops and later on you develop complications related to the medications so these are motor fluctuations and psychosis due to the drugs so all this occurs in the various stages of the parkinson disease so i'll be taking you through all the stages how to start the treatment when to start the treatment how to go about the medication what are the common side effects and when do we go for the advanced treatment modalities which are available and sometimes it may not be possible uh, for the general physicians or even the neurologists to manage the patients because when it goes into the advanced stages with all fluctuations and all those things then you may require the help of a movement disorder specialist and a specialized parkinsonism treatment centers for further management of this disorder so these are the six modalities of treatment which we commonly use in our day to day practice so these are the drugs which we commonly use which is widely available so the most common is levodopa which we all know 
then there is the myobi inhibitors so which have the rasagilin seligilin and the newer agent which is available since past one to two years that is safinamide you are having the dopamine agonist then the methyl transferase inhibitors are there anticholinergics and amantadine so these are the six common uh, medications group of medications which we use the mechanism can be clear with this diagram you know that tyrosine is converted to the liver dopa and that gives rise to the dopamine the dop this is the presynaptic terminal this is the post synaptic terminal this is the synaptic vesicle and here you are having the dopamine receptors so the dopamine is formed and then it is degraded by the myob enzyme so you are having the treatment through liver dopa which increases the l dopa level which is converted into the dopamine you are having treatment options to prevent the degradation of the dopamine which is there in the presynaptic terminal so this myob inhibitor will prevent the degradation so the myob inhibitors like seligin and rasagilin will increase the level of uh, dopamine here in the presynaptic terminal now after that the dopamine is is uh, secreted in the synapse so here are having the synaptic uh, 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 the dopamine receptors so this dopamine will attach to the dopamine receptor to give the uh, uh, the effects so you will have dopamine agonists which are synthetic chemicals which bind to the dopamine receptors and mimic dopamine so this is the mechanism by which primipexol ropinarol the other dopamine agonists like perclide bromocretin etc acts in the synapse the dopamine will be degraded by the comt enzyme and this is inhibited by the comt inhibitors which we are having like the entacapone tolcapone and the newly uh, uh, fda approved opicapone so these are the three agents which will be acting at this level now once the dopamine is here the the uh, there is the dopamine gets reuptake in the presynaptic terminal so this reuptake is prevented by amantadine the major it has lot of mechanism there are four to five mechanisms of action of amantadine this is the predominant mechanism so these are the various mechanisms by this group of medications act you are having the acetylcholine inhibitors here now in parkinsonism what happens is the dopamine deficiency occurs and the cholinergic pathway gets hyper excitable so you give the uh, acetylcholine inhibitors like trihexyphenidyl and benzotropin etc to reduce the cholinergic hyperactivity so that is the sixth mechanism of action so based on this either you give levodopa either you give myob inhibitors to increase the availability of dopamine you prevent reuptake by giving amantadine you prevent the de degradation of the dopamine by giving comt inhibitors you stimulate the dopamine receptors by giving dopamine agonist or you uh inhibit the acetylcholine by giving acetylcholine inhibitors so by all these mechanisms you can increase the availability of the dopamine or the dopamine uh, st stimulating pathways and this forms the basis of treatment of parkinson disease now you should understand that in other conditions like parkinson plus atypical parkinson vascular parkinson the mechanism is not dopamine deficiency so there are many other mechanisms so that is why these medications may not be effective in conditions like uh, for psp or msa or cortico basal ganglionic degeneration etc so this may not be very effective now what about the treatment of uh, uh, parkinson disease so once you see that a patient comes with unilateral tremor and rigidity and all the typical features and you think that this is idiopathic parkinson disease and you rule out all other mimics either by clinical diagnosis clinical examination or by investigations wherever required like mri or ct scan of the brain then you have to decide regarding the treatment now the treatment of parkinson disease you have to understand is a shared decision so you have to counsel the patient first sitting with the patient is very crucial you have to make them understand the uh, natural course of the disorder how the disorder is going to be what all medications you are having and all those things clearly to the patient and then it has to be a decision on mutual discussion like it always uh, should be so it depends upon the uh, effect of the parkinson disease on the patient what is the effect of the dominant hand so what what degree the disorder has affected the work the activities of daily living social or leisure activity what is the level of bradykinesia and gait disturbance and what are the patient's understanding and uh, preferences regarding the treatment so all these factors has to be taken into account before you start the treatment now you should also remember that there are a lot of uh, confusion regarding when to start treatment there is a school of thought in which they uh, told that the earlier the dopamine uh, treatment is started 
the gradually the response fades off so it is better to start late so all these uh, things were there there were studies which were done in uh, uh, various countries and it was found that actually the uh, timing and the drug has little impact on the long term outcome of the parkinson disease in term of motor fluctuation and dyskinesia so you need not be uh, afraid that if you start the medicine early then you will get dyskinesia early or motor fluctuation early it's not like that the uh, motor fluctuation and dyskinesia depend upon the stage of the disease and the progression of the disorder rather than the medications which you are starting except if you start in uh, uh, young patients levodopa it may give rise to early dyskinesia otherwise usually there is not much association so whenever you feel the quality of life of the patient is affected the profession is affected and it is causing disability to the patient you can definitely start the medication now always start with the lowest possible dose and try to start in a single agent and then go for combination and depending upon the uh, progression of the disorder you can uh, modify the dosage of the medications now how to choose the initial therapy there is no preferred single initial therapy and it depends upon the age of the patient which is very important which i'll discuss later the disease and the medications which you are going to use the patient's comorbidity the health status of the patient and various other things which you have to consider before starting the treatment the common things you have to remember is the uh, potency and the side effect profile of the drug for example if you take the myob inhibitors and amantadine so these are having very less anti parkinsonism action so they are uh, less effective but well tolerated and can be used for mild symptoms so that is myob inhibitors and amantadine if you go for levodopa it is the most uh, potent uh, dopamine uh, agent it is most effective and but the problem is it has to be given frequently so you have to give give at least 3 to 4 times per day and there is high risk of dopaminergic motor complications with levodopa but it is very potent now dopamine agonist is intermediate between levodopa and myob inhibitor and amantadine so it comes in between and lower risk of motor complications so the wearing off and all the dyskinesias are less compared to levodopa but there is risk of other side effects like hallucinations impulse control disorders and it is not well tolerated in the older and the cognitive uh, uh, cognitive uh, patients who are having cognitive issues so it can give rise to psychosis delirium and all those issues so you have to keep into mind the potency of the drug the age of the patient and all those things before starting uh, the uh, medication also what type of parkinsonism the patient is having whether it's a tremor dominant parkinsonism whether it's a rigidity dominant parkinsonism so that will also come into the picture when you start the medication okay so suppose a patient comes with very mild symptoms minimal impact on the daily life so there is very little impact on the day, uh, daily life so you can uh counsel the patient and even say that you may not start medication at this point of time because you are absolutely okay you are able to do your work and you are able to do your day to day activities however if there is some disability and if the patient prefers to have a medication then you can go for a myob inhibitor or amantadine monotherapy so that either rasagilin or selegilin or uh, you can give amantadine as a monotherapy for the initial stage if the patient is very old and and then levodopa may be preferred in the initial stage because there are, this medications can give rise to delirium and psychosis in the very elderly population so very mild symptoms either myob myob inhibitor or amantadine would be the drug of choice now if you are having a patient with tremor dominant parkinsonism only tremors rigidity is not much and bradykinesia is also not much then if it is a younger patient you can go for anticholinergic medication like trihexyphenidyl and if it is a somewhat elderly patient then you can go for amantadine monotherapy as we all know trihexyphenidyl causes lot of confusion psychosis it has issues with the prostate it has issues with the blood pressure and all those issues so uh, it can cause orthostatic hypotension in the elderly so it's better to go for amantadine in the elderly and if it's a young patient with tremor dominant parkinsonism trihexyphenidyl may be the drug of choice now coming to mild to moderate symptoms affecting the daily life so if it is affecting the interfering the daily life of the patient then either you can start a dopamine agonist and levodopa or levodopa now here the most important thing is the age of the patient so if the age of the patient is less than 65 years 
then it is preferable to start dopamine agonist 65 some guidelines say 60 some say it is 65 so 60 to 65 years or less that is young uh, patient you can start dopamine agonist and if it's a older patient more than 65 years dopamine agonist has lot of side effects as i already mentioned so it is better to go for levodopa therapy in this patient so that depends upon the age if it is mild to moderate symptom now if the patient has moderate to severe symptoms is severely akinetic is unable to walk and has severe parkinsonism then levodopa is the preferred drug of choice because it is the most potent drug and it will give uh, 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 relief to the patient and bring uh, control the symptoms best so in this patients if it is a younger patient again if it uh, the uh, younger patient we would prefer for a dopamine agonist if the patient is less than 65 however if dopamine agonist is not tolerated then again levodopa may be used as the first line medication now it should be remembered that in moderate to severe parkinsonism sometime one medication may not be enough so you start with levodopa and if the medic the drugs are not uh, giving uh, your in gradually start gradually and then increase the dose and if you see that the effect is not up to the mark you can add dopamine agonist along with the medication for severe parkinsonism so these are the various things you either divide as asymptomatic parkinsonism tremor dominant parkinsonism mild to moderate and moderate to severe parkinsonism moderate to severe levodopa you give if it is mild to moderate then depending upon the age of the patient if it's age less than 65 you go for dopamine agonist if it's more than 65 you can start uh, levodopa and in mild parkinsonism or in a very early stage you can either give amantadine or myo b monotherapy can be started so this is the overall initial initiation of the drug now i will go into the each group of the medication how to titrate the dose and what are the common side effects and the issues regarding the treatment coming to levodopa this is the age old medication which we use it is the most effective anti parkinsonism medication it is best for a kinetic type of parkinsonism tremor and rigidity responds best but postural instability usually do not respond to the anti parkinsonism Uh, 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 through to levodopa so rest of the symptoms are taken care of but usually the postural instability stays on now why should it uh, be given with carbidopa why not levodopa alone because levodopa can be converted by the peripheral decarboxylase to dopamine in the systemic circulation so which can give rise to nausea vomiting orthostatic hypotension and all the side effects so it's not well tolerated so usually it is given with a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor so that is why we use the combination of levodopa carbidopa which is widely available and usually we give it as a combination to prevent the systemic effect of dopamine now the dosage either you can have 10 100 mg in which you are having levodopa of 100 and carbidopa 10 or 25 and 100 mg or 25 and 250 mg all these combinations are we are widely available there is a combination with <coughs> with benzazide and levodopa also which is not much used it can have a immediate release formulation or a controlled release preparation both preparations are available you have to start with the lowest possible dose so either you start with half tablet two times or three times daily titrate it very slowly over weeks to go to the maximum possible dose in which the patient has symptom relief or has side effects and the titration should be very gradual initially you can take it with meals because there may be severe nausea and vomiting in some of the patients however later on uh, during the uh, disease course when the patient develops motor fluctuations and all those issues then it is preferable to take it one hour before or after the meals elderly patients above 75 you should be very careful you can start with the lowest possible dose and the titration period also has to be uh, uh, has to be longer because this may this patients may have delirium and psychiatric side effects because of the stimulating effect of the dopamine now the usual the standard dose is 300 to 600 mg of levodopa and most of the patients respond at this dose now if you are given a dose a very high dose of up to 1000 to 1500 mg and still there is no response to the uh, uh, the the tremor and the rigidity then you should think of a alternative diagnosis like essential tremor or some other mimic which is causing the symptomatology so levodopa re responsiveness is the hallmark of parkinson disease which we have to remember 
now there is renal impairment and hepatic impairment you have to be cautious however there is no strict calculation which has been suggested but the uh, dosage has to be kept low as low as possible and also the titration has to be slower in this patients now regarding the control release you have to be uh, uh, aware that the control release preparations are not completely absorbed and 30% higher dose than that of the immediate releasing uh, tablets has to be given and it is better to start with the immediate release preparation and later on switch off to control release preparation if the patient wants the drug to be taken once or twice a day and initially you can take after meals to avoid nausea and later on as i already tell uh, told it has it can be taken before the food whenever the patient has advanced parkinson disease and fluctuations the common side effects as i already mentioned nausea somnolence dizziness and headache is there serious ones are confusion hallucination delusions agitation and psychosis which is seen in the elderly more in the elderly population with higher dosage of medications so one thing you should remember is that whenever the patient is uh, unstable is admitted in the hospital and then you are seeing that the patient has features of parkinsonism etc with lot of medical issues like hyponatremia sepsis and all those things elderly patient you should stabilize the patient first and then go for the levodopa therapy because otherwise the patient may land into delirium and other complications on starting the medications the other complications which are lesser known is the increased risk of hip, hip fractures in elderly patients because of increased serum homocysteine levels and also sensory motor peripheral neuropathy which can occur with idiopathic parkinson disease peripheral neuropathy has also been seen in patients who are taking duodopa pump so patients nowadays there is new treatment which is available in which uh, the uh, duodopa is uh, there is the combination is introduced directly into the jejunum uh, through a peg tube so these patients also have increased risk of sensory motor peripheral neuropathy probably due to depletion of vitamin b12 the mechanism is not very uh, clear other rare side effects with uh, uh, levodopa is dopamine dysregulation syndrome and impulse control disorder which i'll be speaking of and the these are the motor complications which i'll be going into detail later on the wearing off phenomena the dyskinesias the dystonias and the various cramps which can occur in this patients now good news is levodopa has been the cornerstone of the therapy for almost 30 years and we know most of the side effects which are related to the uh, 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 levodopa it is the most effective drug in the treatment of parkinson disease and most of the patients will develop with will get a benefit of treatment with levodopa in the initial stages of the disorder now the bad news is as we go higher on the dose you see here 150 mg of levodopa 300 mg 600 mg so as you go higher to 600 mg the dyskinesia risk the dystonia risk and the wearing off all increases in many folds so the higher the dose the more chances of developing the uh, dyskinesias dystonia and wearing off and certain unmet needs, uh, needs of uh, mid to late stage parkinson disease are there you can see this cartoon this is the clinical effect this is the levodopa intake and you can see this is the dyskinesia threshold here and this is the response threshold in early parkinson disease you give a dose and you get the complete response and in the moderate parkinson disease the dyskinesia threshold comes uh, lower and then their response also becomes narrow so you get the broad response here you can see there is a narrow response here and in the advanced parkinson disease the dyskinesia threshold goes very down you get dyskinesia on very small doses of uh, the uh, levodopa and then the response also becomes narrower so this changes according to the disease stage so that becomes very very difficult that's why i told it is quite complicated to manage advanced parkinson disease in the later stages in which even minor dosage may cause sudden peak in the action and then the effect also wears off very rapidly the dyskinesia threshold also reduces giving rise to severe dyskinesias now coming to the second group of medication the dopamine agonist there are two types of dopamine agonist so one is the ergot der derived and then the non ergot derivatives this group usually we do not use in uh, uh, parkinson disease because of the side effects cabergolin bromocyptin and pergolide pergolide has also been uh, linked to val valvular uh, uh, fibrosis and bromocyptin is not much effective in parkinson disease so usually this group is not used we use the non ergot derivatives most commonly used group is the primipexol and ropinerol apomorphine 
has been available uh, since uh, uh, long duration but now it has been used as rescue therapy and it is being used as rescue therapy either as injections or pumps uh, for patients who are having unpredictable offs and also rotigotin which is available as a transdermal patch so these two molecules are not much used in clinical practice regularly apomorphin and rotigotin while premipexor and ropinorol has is uh, used on a day to day basis in parkinson disease now what are the advantages of our levodopa now if uh, if you compare ropinorol and this is premipexol and you compare uh, with levodopa you can see the dyskinesia risk the wearing off is almost half in ropinorol and similarly the wearing off and dyskinesias are almost 50% of that what is seen in levodopa compared to uh, the dopamine agonist so it has a better uh, side effect uh, profile in motor complications compared to that of levodopa if you look at the other side effects levodopa versus ropinorol and levodopa versus premipexol peripheral edema hallucinations are more compared to that of levodopa so more edema and more hallucinations can occur with ropinorol and premipexol compared to levodopa while the nausea risk is almost the same and postural hypotension probably is less in uh, premipexol but for ropinorol it is almost same to that of levodopa so these two side effects are more common in the ropinorol and the premipexol group so these are basically synthetic uh, agents that directly stimulate the dopamine receptors so these are the various approved agents now the indications for dopamine agonist as i already mentioned young onset parkinsonism less than say, 60 to 65 years it can be started because the risk of dyskinesias are less so this is used in younger patients who are having uh, features of parkinson disease and which is affecting the day to day life and it is moderate to severe mild to moderate in intensity and it can also be used in advanced parkinson disease where there is complications like motor fluctuations and dyskinesia once you give levodopa for long time so these agents are not much used which i already told and now coming to the common drugs which we use that is primipexol the standard dose is 0.125 it has to be started as a low dose of 0.125 three times a day and it has to be increased 0.125 per dose every 5 to 7 days to give a therapeutic dose of almost uh, 4.5 to 6 mg it can be given up to 8 to 10 mg also in uh, in severe cases but the optimum dose is around 4.5 to 6 mg of premipexol it is also available as extended release tablets so it can be given is either uh, once or twice daily dosage also so that is again one advantage compared to that of uh, levodopa pre uh, preparations now ropinorol the initial starting dose is 0.25 unlike uh, premipexol which is 0.125 it is 0.25 when you start with three times a day gradually increase 0.25 to a total therapeutic dose of 3 mg maximum you can give up to 12 to 16 mg of dose and most of the patients can be managed from 3 to 6 mg of ropinorol as well now transdermal rotigotin it is not widely available and i have not used it in clinical practice it is available as a a uh, daily patch so which can be started as 2 mg for 24 hours and it can be gradually titrated to 6 mg for 24 hours now this is one interesting uh, find used recently uh, recently it is called as apomorphin so it is used to treat off episodes of levodopa induced motor fluctuations so whenever you start levodopa and there are a lot of motor complications apomorphin pump can be used in a sos basis to treat the off so what is the issue with apomorphin you have to give a challenge test before starting the apomorphin so you give with a 2 mg subcutaneous dosage under medical supervision and you have to check the blood pressure after 20 40 60 minutes after the injection because there may be severe orthostatic hypotension you have to give anti emetic therapy metoclopramide or procloperazine may be started start with 2 mg and then gradually 1 mg per dose you can increase maximum dosage average you have to give three times per day and it should exceed five times and the maximum dosage is 20 mg so this can be used in the later stages of the disorder however initial uh, dosages has to be given uh, after giving a challenge and see we have to ma uh, make sure that the patient is tolerating the medication and there is not much uh, orthostatic hypotension or other complications which may occur so other issues are nausea vomiting constipation peripheral 
uh, edema which can occur with chronic dopamine agonist and psychiatric side effects like psychosis which can also occur the apomorphin side effects are cutaneous reactions chest pain angina and orthostatic hypotension which can occur so the cardiac risk factors has to be taken care of when you are giving apomorphin injections now three syndromes are there which has to be remembered whenever we speak about dopamine agonist one is daws so that is dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome so whenever a patient is on dopamine agonist if you suddenly withdraw the uh, medications so they may develop a withdrawal symptom like you see in benzodiazepines like they may develop anxiety panic attacks depression sweating dizziness and drug craving so this is called as daws so this in this case you have to restart the dopamine agonist in a lower dose similarly i i will also caution all everybody who are using this medication levodopa and the dopamine agonist and all the medication for parkinson disease it should not be stopped suddenly because sudden stoppage of this medications can even give rise to neuroleptic malignant syndrome and severe uh, symptoms severe rigidity and all those symptoms may occur so it has to be gradually stopped any medication like dopamine agonist and levodopa now the second important disorder is impulse control disorder or it's also called as icd so this is a very important symptom and this may be uh, difficult to diagnose so you have to counsel the patient relative and uh, 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 patient relatives who are handling with the patient so they may have they may see the symptoms which may be easily neglected so this can be non bothersome symptoms like compulsive solitaire playing compulsive cleaning or it can be very severe like pathological gambling hypersexuality and all those things so hypersexuality pathological gam gambling and compulsive behavior should be seeked for whenever you give this medication during the follow up almost 5 to 15% of the patient will develop this symptom and by 5 years usually 50% may have the symptoms of impulse control disorder so this has to be taken care of and the risk factors are younger patients male gender who are having comorbid anxiety and depression and the risk factors are uh, uh, similar for all the dopamine agonist preparation and higher doses of levodopa may also cause this icd but it, the uh, chances are less compared to that of dopamine agonist so if there is icd you have to gradually stop the dopamine agonist and add levodopa instead of dopamine agonist if you see feel that the patient is developing a impulse control disorder second is dopamine dysregulation syndrome now what happens is here the patient Uh, after taking the dopamine agonist starts taking extra tablet of dopamine agonist despite of developing the side effects so this is called as dopamine dysregulation syndrome in which they start misusing the medication usually it occurs with male patients with early onset parkinson disease who take increasing quantities of dopamine drugs despite increasing side effects so this also has to be uh, closely monitored whenever you start dopamine agonist so this three syndromes of dopamine dysregulation dopamine uh, uh, impulse control disorder and dopamine agonist withdrawal should be kept into mind whenever you are treating uh, patients with dopamine agonist and they may be having uh, psychiatric comorbidities and psychiatric symptoms like hypomania maniac psychosis pathological gambling punding and all those things may also be associated with dopamine dysregulation syndrome as well so we have gone through this now these are the side effects one is in the postpartum uh, uh, period they may develop reduced milk production also so this may must be kept into mind and the rare side effects of the ergot related as we already know bromocyptin and all those things may cause pulmonary fibrosis and uh, reynolds phenomena as well as uh, valvular fibrosis but these medications are not commonly used in parkinson disease one important thing is primipexol can cause sleep attacks so these patients should be aware of this complication in a higher dose they may develop sudden sleep attack which may give rise to uh, accidents as well so there should be a word of caution regarding this as well so i have already mentioned this so i'll skip this slide now coming to the next group that is the myob inhibitors myob inhibitors most commonly is selegiline and rasagiline and uh, there were some um, initial notion that there was a study called as the data top study which told that there is some neuroprotective action by the myob inhibitors but further studies could not prove that there is any conclusive neuroprotective uh, uh, effect on the uh, the parkinson disease and it is a early treatment it is a good option because it is well tolerated so in the early uh, parkinson disease this can be started or it can start later on when the patient develops 
the other complications related to levodopa so it is approved by the us fda as the initial monotherapy in patients with earliest parkinson disease as well as advanced moderate to severe uh, advanced parkinson disease as well so the dose of selegiline is 5 mg od and you can give up to 10 mg daily and it is a non selective myobi inhibitor so there is increased risk of hypertensive crisis whenever you are giving with vitamin containing foods so you have to be careful and then advise them against taking cheese and all those things because it is a non selective myo inhibitor now rasagilin lower dose 1 mg it has to be used start with 0.5 mg and gradually increase to 1 mg once daily and what are the side effects of this medication nausea and headache may occur some patient complaint of headache and selegilin may cause insomnia selegilin may give rise to confusion in the elderly and selegilin enhances the effect of levodopa by showing its oxidative mechanism and increases dyskinesia and psychiatric manifestations in patient who take levodopa so it can worsen the delirium when patient is on levodopa and selegilin is combined along with that now i'll go to the newer agent which is available so it is if uh, called as safinamide it is a myob inhibitor and it is approved by the us fda in 2017 and india uh, in 2019 and we have been using it quite uh, often now so it is used mainly in adult patients with mid to late stage fluctuating disease as a add on therapy to the stable dose of levodopa alone or in combination so unlike selegilin and uh, rasagilin which is used in the early stages safinamide is used in the later stages when the patient develops dyskinesia and it is very when it is difficult to treat the parkinsonism so the mechanism so it has a dopaminergic mechanism like a myob inhibitor along with that it has non dopaminergic action it blocks the voltage dependent sodium channels and modulates the n type calcium channels and prevents glutamate release and reduces nmdr stimulation so it improves the motor functions through the dopaminergic pathway as well as reduces dyskinesia and protects the excitotoxic uh, damage through the non dopaminergic pathway so it has multiple mechanisms unlike rasagilin and selegilin dosage it is, should be started as 50 mg per day and the dosage may be increased to 100 mg per day on the individual basis and no change is required in elderly patients and it has been found that the psychiatric effects of uh, safinamide is less compared to that of the other myob inhibitors that is rasagilin and selegilin so chances of delirium are less and severe hepatic impa impairment it is contraindicated moderate hepatic impairment you have to give 50 mg uh, and you should not go to 100 mg per day and mild hepatic impairment you can give the medication renal impairment there is no change uh, required for patients with renal impairment so hepatic uh, liver functions you have to be careful when you are using safinamide there is not much of drug drug interaction and there is not much of dietary uh, interactions with the dietary tyramine uh, content so it is more safer compared to the other medication similarly it may be used with ssri and the risk of serotonergic syndrome is also less uh, in safinamide pregnancy and lactation and breastfeeding the data is not clear and it is not yet recommended in this population contraindications i already told there may be hypersensitivity it should not be used with the other myob inhibitors it should not be used with pethidine and severe hepatic impairment you have to be careful diabetic patient with severe diabetic retinopathy and retinal involvement or eye involvement like uveitis you should be careful in this patients now coming to the compt inhibitors tolcapen and the entacapen are the common compt inhibitors which we use so they are basically levodopa extenders and they are ineffective when given alone so they should be given along with the levodopa dosage Uh, as a add on therapy to prevent the fluctuations of the dosage of the levodopa so they has to be added along with the levodopa so tolcapon is not much into clinical use because of the fulminant hepatotoxicity entacapon is that which is available in india and we use it commonly the newer drug which is fda approved is opicapon which is not av yet available in our country so it inhibits the peripheral and the central uh, methylation of the levodopa and the dopamine and increase the levodopa uh half life it becomes more stable and it helps in reduction of the levodopa dosage by 30% now the dosage is 200 mg with each dosage of uh, uh levodopa carbidopa combination and the maximum it can be used up to 8 times per day so 1600 mg can be used 
adverse effect it can increase the levodopa toxicity diarrhea may be there there may be orange urine discoloration and hepatotoxicity which i already mentioned with tolcapon which is not commonly used so orange urine discoloration should be explained to the patient uh, patient when you whenever you are giving antacapon now coming to anticholinergic medication so this group of medication is again uh, quite commonly used in less than 70 years with disturbing tremor dominant parkinsonism you can use this trihexyphenidyl is the commonly used agent and you start with 0.5 to 1 mg twice daily to 2 mg three times daily so 6 mg up to 6 mg you can be using in this patients benzotropin is again another agent and it can be start with 0.5 to 2 mg twice daily now the issues as we already know you have to be careful the adverse effects are quite common with this patients i have seen even uh, starting with 2 mg half half tablet and the patient developing severe psychosis and delirium which stopped on stopping the medication so it can really cause cognitive issues in the patient so you have to be extremely careful when we use uh, uh, in the elderly patient it can cause memory issues confusion hallucinations and it can cause dry mouth blurred vision constipation which we already know patients with uh, prostatic symptoms may develop urinary retention and uh, glaucoma is again one contraindication they may precipitate a angle closure of glaucoma as well and discontinuation again you have to be very slow so you should not stop the medication suddenly because that it may cause a acute exacerbation of parkinsonism and may even lead to lead to neurolept malignant syndrome so all the parkinsonism medication starting and uh, titration should be slow and even stopping should be very gradual and slow now coming to the last medication that is amantadine it has it is a antiviral agent as we all know and various mechanisms of action increase dopamine release inhibit dopamine uptake nmdr reaction central anticholinergic action four to five mechanisms are there and it is mainly used to reduce the levodopa related dyskinesias and motor fluctuation so this is the standard recommendation so it is one of the most important medication which has been found to reduce the dyskinesias and it can be tried as 200 to 300 mg you start with 100 mg and titrate up to 300 mg and for dyskinesias you can go up to 400 mg renal failure you have to be careful the dose has to be modified because it is excreted in the urine the side effects a classical skin lesion, uh, lesion can occur that is libido reticularis ankle edema is there again delirium it can cause delirium confusions and hallucination in the elderly patients so this is the summary of the medications which i have already mentioned uh, so one is levodopa dopamine agonist monoamine inhibitors comt inhibitors nmdr agonist that is uh, amantadine and the anticholinergic agents which can be used now after starting the standard medications you follow up this patients so during the follow up as the uh, duration of the treatment increases the patient start developing the motor complications after 5 to 8 years of therapy so in this stage the history becomes very very important and every time you follow up this patient you have to ask the history because that is the only way in which you can find out motor complications and treat it so ideally what we do is we give a on off chart to the patient so which will have the on means the patient is active and off means the patient is totally uh, uh, feels uh, the patient feels stiff and movement becomes very slow that is the off phase so they'll be given they will be given a on off chart so which will have on on timings off timings as well as the timings in which they develop the dyskinesia so that is the dyskinesia time so this has to be tabulated every hour the medication which has been given also has to be mentioned like when does the patient take the levodopa dosage when did the patient take the uh, uh, dopamine agonist so all has to be mentioned and then they have to note when the patient is on when the patient is off and when did the patient develop the chorea and the movement disorders uh, due to the medications so that is the on off on and off chart which has to be given the patient fills it in the home and brings it during the visit and you can find out what time what medication is giving rise to the issue so that is the only way you can find out uh, what is the uh, motor complication the patient is having and what will be the best approach to manage this motor complication so these all questions should be standard so what is the effect of the medication how long does the effect uh, uh, when does the effect start so that means when does the on appear after starting the levodopa how long does it uh, they be there when does the off start when do you de develop the movement disorder so all these things has to be 
uh, taken care of whenever you see these patients. Now coming to the most difficult part in handling the patients, so that is the motor complications. And uh, it is really difficult, though we can uh, tabulate it and say what all things, but in a busy OPD, it becomes very difficult to find out what uh, is causing it. Sometimes this patient with motor complications, you may also have to admit this patient and then monitor the patient, maintain an on-off chart in the uh, ward by the sister and then or the resident and then see and then titrate the medications and manage the patient. So it may become that difficult to manage this condition. Now, motor fluctuations and dyskinesia, 30 to 40 percent in the first five years and 60 percent by 10 years. So 60 percent of the patient will develop this by 10 years. So motor fluctuation means on and off. So there are various types of motor fluctuation. The most important is wearing off. So that means once you give the levodopa, there is an effect. And initially, the levodopa used to act for three to four hours. And gradually, you see that the action of the levodopa towards the end of the dose becomes less. So it acts for less duration. And the patient goes into a off before the next dose of the levodopa is delivered. So that is the wearing off, which is quite common. And it is the most and the first uh, motor complication which appears. Second is unpredictable off, in which there is a no obvious relationship between the type of uh, levodopa administration and the appearance of the off symptoms. Third is the freezing of gait. Patient may develop sudden freezing of gait without any relation to the levodopa dosage. Then failure of on response. Sometimes the levodopa may not work at all. So you give the levodopa, there is no effect of the medication. So that is the failure of on. And sometimes you may get an acute akinesia. So a Parkinson patient uh, admitted for some medical issues, some uh, fracture or some other issues, and then the patient becomes totally bedridden, stiff, bradykinetic, and with tremors and it does not respond to the levodopa. So this is called as acute akinesia. So this, these are the various type of motor fluctuations which may occur in advanced Parkinson disease. And there are various type of dyskinesia. So dyskinesia means movement disorder. So when you see the patient, they may be developing a lot of movements in the hands, in the face, and the legs. So these are called as dyskinesia. So this may be related to the levodopa medication. So there are various type of dyskinesia. One is peak dose dyskinesia. You give a medication, the dopamine level uh, the levodopa gets absorbed, the dopamine level increases. So at the peak of the dopamine action, so you get a dyskinesia. So that is called as peak dose dyskinesia. Usually starts from 30 to 90 minutes. There is something called as a diaphasic dyskinesia <clears throat> in which there is a, uh, once there is a peak, there is a dyskinesia. And then when the level goes down, again, you get a dyskinesia. So that is called a diaphasic dyskinesia, which may be very difficult to manage, then you may be having a wearing of dyskinesia. And sometimes you may get a wearing of dystonia. So early morning dystonia, patient wakes up with a dystonic posturing of the legs, painful. So that is wearing of dystonia. So these all movement disorders and dyskinesias may again occur with advanced uh, Parkinson disease and it is a part of the motor complications. So this is a chart which shows the various dyskinesias, peak dose dyskinesia, diaphasic dyskinesia, off-state dystonias, on-state dystonia, and something called as yo-yo dyskinesia, in which it becomes totally unpredictable. So you cannot really find out whether it is in the peak dosage or it is a varying effect. So that is called as <coughs> yo-yo dyskinesias. So all this can occur in the Parkinson dyskinesias. And sometimes it may be a mixture of all this. So they, that is called as complicated dyskinesia, which can again occur. So a uh, common way to identify in the uh, busy OPD is if it occurs in the upper part of the limbs, upper limbs and the chest, so it is peak dose dyskinesia. If it occurs in the lower part of the leg and it is a chorea and myoclonic jerk, so it is a diaphasic dyskinesia. And if it occurs in the lower limb, <clears throat> especially in the early morning hour, it is a off dystonia. And sometimes, even in patients with atypical Parkinsonism, like multi-system atrophy, if you give levodopa, they develop facial dyskinesia. You can see in this diagram, there is facial dyskinesia. So if a Parkinson patient, uh, Parkinsonium syndrome develops facial dyskinesia after starting levodopa, it is likely to be multi-system atrophy rather than Parkinson disease. So this again may give a clue regarding the atypical Parkinson variant. Now, how to manage the dyskinesia? I will go into two uh, uh, diagrams. So one is wearing of management. So there is no standard approach. So it is a trial and error approach. One important thing is that the absorption of the levodopa and the duodenum 
and its transport across the blood brain barrier are facilitated by large neutral amino acid transport of proteins suppose if the patient takes lot of protein along with the diet so that may give rise to competition in the transport with the neutral amino acids and that may give rise to lack of absorption of the dopamine and the transport to the brain so that may cause the wearing off so the diet chart has to be taken care of in the advanced parkinson disease and you should ask about the diet and tell them to avoid protein along with the drug and the drug should be taken in the empty stomach 30 to 60 minutes before or 60 to 90 minutes after a meal sometimes you may make the uh, levodopa liquid and then it can be taken to im improve the absorption of the along with lime and all those thing you can uh, take it so to improve the absorption of the medication so protein should be avoided and the diet history has to be taken there is a protein redistribution diet which has been proposed in which the protein is given in the evening hours and the morning hour the protein is not given so the proper diet a uh, dietitian uh, consultation also has to be given to this patient in advanced parkinson disease and when you are getting a wearing off management then what you can do is you can increase the dose of the levodopa or make the dose very frequent so rather than giving three times you can give four to five times so that the wearing off can be managed or you can increase the single dose of levodopa and if it does not work then you can add either a comp inhibitor myobi inhibitor or other drugs to uh, Uh, improve the effect of the levodopa so this comp inhibitor can be added which i already told entacapone is available in india so we add this along with the dosage of the levodopa so that the availability of the levodopa can be increased and the dosage of the levodopa can also be brought down by 30% so that the dyskinesias can also reduce other agent which can be added is myobi inhibitors then a new agent which is not available in india it's called as istradafilin it is a oral adenosine a2 receptor agonist and it is fda approved in 2019 for the wearing off symptoms so this can this is a new agent which can be used so this is the treatment of wearing off so you first adjust the levodopa you add levodopa to dopamine agonist dopamine agonist can be started increase the frequency or dosage of levodopa add comp inhibitor you can make the levodopa sustained release so that it can have a even peak rather than going for the dyskinesias and if all the medical management fails then you can go for deep brain stimulation now sudden unpredictable off sometimes the patient may go for a sudden off which may not be related to the levodopa dosage so in this case you can have three line of management one is apomorphin so which can be available as subcutaneous injection which i already mentioned you have to give the challenge test and give the apomorphin then you are having a continuous subcutaneous infusion of apomorphin which is again available sublingual films of apomorphin has been fda approved in this year only may 2020 for on demand use it is not available in india so that may again be used and inhaled levodopa is also available and fda approved in 2018 though it is not available in india till now so these are the advanced treatment modalities which may help us in the future for sudden unpredictable off so the available one is subcutaneous apomorphin the other agents that is continuous infusion sublingual apomorphin and inhale levodopa may again be uh, quite helpful in managing unpredictable offs so there is lot of data and randomized controlled trial which shows apomorphin sublingual infusions uh, sublingual film as well as levodopa inhalation powders which may be quite effective in treating the unpredictable offs now peak dose dyskinesia what should you do yeah so peak dose dyskinesia what you can do is you substitute the immediate release with the sustained release tablet of levodopa carbidopa you remove selegilin you lower the individual doses of levodopa carbidopa because it's a peak peak dose effect so you have to reduce the individual doses give control release tablet and you can add comp inhibitor or dopamine agonist along with that so this is how you manage the peak dose dyskinesia diaphasic dyskinesia is quite difficult to manage you give more frequent dosage of levodopa carbidopa add dopamine agonist and restrict the levodopa carbidopa uh, to early to mid day dosage uh, for the treatment of this dyskinesias so these are the dyskinesias now uh, there is something called as early morning dystonia so early morning dystonia is treated by giving a controlled release tablet of uh, levodopa carbidopa at night so which can take care of the early morning dystonia or you can have a very early morning dose of levodopa in the morning period so this is how you manage roughly the various type of dyskinesias and the dystonias which can occur in the 
uh, during the treatment of the parkinson disease advanced parkinson disease now going to device assisted and surgical therapy so when do we opt for the second line management in patients with complicated parkinson disease so there are three things which are commonly used in clinical practice one is deep brain stimulation as we all know then there is continuous levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel which is called as lcig which is uh, given through a peg uh, gastrogenostomy tube and there is continuous subcutaneous apomorphin infusion so these are the three promising treatment modalities which help us in treatment of this advanced and complicated cases so what are the indications for using device assisted therapies so whenever there is severe troublesome motor fluctuations motor fluctuations causing disability or reduced quality of life inconsistent response to the treatment dyskinesias which are not getting benefited with the various uh, approaches which i told regarding the management and when the levodopa dosage is more than four times uh, uh, four or more times and if there is severe medication refractory tremor then deep brain stimulation may be quite effective so this case patients you have to select and then plan for device assisted therapy so these are the three device assisted therapy which i mentioned <clears throat> apomorphin pump duodopa pump and the deep brain stimulation so you have to select the patients quite carefully in deep brain stimulation there should not be any cognitive impairment there should not be any psychiatric problems uh, because this may worsen the symptoms and duodopa pump again there is no limitation regarding this and for apomorphin pump again there is no such restrictions as in deep brain stimulation so this is the apomorphin pump which is available so you can see this is given uh the medicine is put here there is a automated pump here and which infuses the uh, uh, apomorphin into the subcutaneous plane this is the duodopa pump kit here the duodopa is uh, there is a cassette of duodopa mixture which is put here and there is a uh, automated uh, uh, the device which will push the uh, uh, duodopa through the stomach and there is a connector which directly places it into the jejunum so it is directly absorbed from the jejunum so the various absorption problems related to the stomach are bypassed by this device so these two devices are quite promising though it is not widely available and not widely used but it is the treatment of future which will be available in our countries uh, i guess very soon now coming to the surgical treatment so what are the surgical treatment so we speak about dbs there are other ablative treatment also there is thalamotomy pallidotomy subthalamotomy focused ultrasound ablation of the various parts of uh, uh, thalamus and the nucleus are also available and it is uh, uh, randomized controlled trials have shown that focused ultrasound may be quite effective and may be similar to that of uh, deep brain stimulation and deep brain stimulation as we all know there are three sites it may be in the ventro intermedial thalamus the globus pallidus or the subthalamic nucleus the stn dbs is the most commonly used and various other uh, experimental treatment uh, measures are also there like transplantation which i'll be showing here now going to the dbs so this is what is commonly used it is widely used in india and for advanced cases we usually uh, send the patient to a movement disorder specialist who along with the neurosurgery team they plan regarding the deep brain stimulation so deep brain stimulation is like a brain pacemaker so you like in the uh, ppi so you will be having a uh, electrode and uh, device here and which will be con connected by minor wires in the brain and uh, this will give rise to uh, stimulation in the brain and these are the mechanism of action of the deep brain stimulation i am not going into the details about that so before going into the deep brain stimulation you should carefully select the patient because it's a very uh, expensive uh, treatment and the treatment in india it costs a lot it is not available widely so you have to select the patient and uh, certain symptoms of deep brain stimulation uh, of parkinson disease may be res uh, respond well to the uh, deep brain stimulation like rigidity tremor bradykinesia and dyskinesia respond quite well however speech cognition autonomic symptoms gait instability usually do not respond well to deep brain stimulation and this is similar to levodopa in levodopa also these symptoms usually do not respond well and bradykinesia tremor and all this respond so a patient who is levodopa responsive so the most important criteria is levodopa responsiveness so if the patient is responding to levodopa that means the patient will respond to deep brain stimulation also 
deep brain stimulation has lot of issues as well though it is quite safe but a uh, uh, lot of problems may arise there may be uh, complication related to the surgery like seizure hemorrhage and all those things hardware related issues like lead fracture lead erosions and uh, my lead migration etc and stimulation related so after stimulation patients may have lot of psychiatric issues suicidal tendencies and all may be uh, related to uh, uh, deep brain stimulation depression mania suicidal effect may be there if the leads are not placed properly they may develop dysarthria diplopia and all those complications so the planning has to be done properly and initially uh, the dictum was dbs should be done in the advanced cases with fluctuations that is after 8 to 10 years of the diagnosis but with the early stim study it has been found that it may be quite useful in the earlier stage of the disorder also so this may be again a new change which may occur in the near future in which we send patients for dbs before developing all the uh, advanced complications and the motor fluctuations so this is a summary of the surgical options which are available so i have already mentioned fus that is focused ultrasound and deep brain stimulation which i have already so there is uh, transplantation of fetal mesencephalic cells inside the various nucleus then neurotropic factors can be transplanted in the brain now gene therapy is also available in which various viruses are uh, uh, fused with the uh, the neurotropic factors and then they are transplanted in the brain so there is parkin gene along with adenoviruses so adenovirus is the most common vector which has been used so lot of treatment uh, options are being uh, tried out and lot of studies are being done probably will get good results in the future this is one study recently uh, quoted which uh, says that there is uh, intraepidermal glial cell derived neurotropic factor uh, injections in the brain may quite be useful so there are a lot of studies regarding gene therapy in uh, parkinson disease which is going on and we can wait for the results in the near future now after the motor manifestations as we all know non motor manifestations are also very important so a parkinson patient will have lot of motor manifestation which has to be managed as for example depression you have to give antidepressants it's better to avoid tricyclic antidepressant because of the side effect uh, issues with the various medication better to go for ssris or snris for dementia you can start the patient on rivastigmine or uh, donepezil for psychosis it is important because quetiapin and clozapine and pimvacerin these three antipsychotics are the only recommended antipsychotics in parkinson disease because olanzapine rasperidon and the other older antipsychotics can all worsen the parkinsonism symptoms postal hypotension can be treated with midodrine or fludrocortisone constipation has to be taken care of because it's a very important early manifestation of parkinsonism drooling may be a issue which can be treated by glycopyronium nocturnal akinesia i already told levodopa cr tablets and sleep disorders rem behavioral disorders may be there which can be treated with clonazepam or melatonin so you have to take care of the non motor manifestations also along with the motor manifestations for a proper patient satisfaction and response now one aspect which i would like to uh, comment is in advanced parkinson disease we have always seen that a patient with advanced parkinson disease on lot of medications like levodopa carbidopa combination dopamine agonist myob inhibitors compt inhibitors and sometimes trihexyphenidyl etc gets admitted with medical issues and then you can see that the patient has psychosis delirium hallucinations etc so how do we go about this uh, uh, problem so whenever a parkinson patient develops hallucination and delirium we have to rule out medical conditions which may be triggering it so the most common medical condition is one is hyponatremia other dyselectrolemia infections and medications you go through the medication list there may be some medication which may have been prescribed which may be giving rise to the delirium like a uh, tramadol or some quinolones or some other medications if that is not the case after ruling that out you have to look at the drug chart and the parkinsonism medication so if it is very severe confusion and delirium then the first drug which you have to discontinue is anticholinergics gradually titrate and stop the second medication which may cause more confusion and psychosis is amantadine third is myob inhibitor fourth is dopamine agonist so this has to be gradually tapered and reduced according to this order <clears throat> and if still the delirium persist then last drug to be taken off should be levodopa and the medication which can be tried for psychosis is clozapine and quetiapine which are both with least anti parkinsonism effects 
So this is how you approach a patient with cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. You can again add donepezil also, which may uh, improve the cognition in such patients. So this is the last two slides which I have. This is a summary of uh, uh, what is given. So this is from the European uh, guidelines. So you have to go for, uh, whenever you get Parkinsonism, apart from the medical management, you will go for physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. So all this has to be taken care of. In the West, they, they are having specific Parkinson disease nurse specialist. So if you are having a good hospital, then you can have a special uh, nurse who can look after this Parkinson patients who will be aware of all the issues regarding that. Then you manage the non-motor and the motor symptoms. Motor symptoms, if it is disabling, you can start the medications as I already mentioned. Either you can start with a dopamine agonist if it's a young patient, if it's an older patient with severe Parkinsonism, moderate to severe, you start with levodopa. Very mild uh, Parkinson patient, you start with myob inhibitors or amantidine. Once the patient develops the dyskinesias, then you try to find out what type of dyskinesia it is, what is the pathophysiology of that. And depending on that, you add dopamine agonist, myob inhibitor or COMT inhibitor along with the levodopa. Non-motor, I've already mentioned. And uh, amantidine, again, has a very important effect of dyskinesis. So any dyskinesia patient, amantidine should be added. Look for the various side effects like impulse control uh, issues, dopamine dysregulation syndrome and all. And finally, if it is advanced Parkinson's disease, you have to go for the uh, deep brain stimulation or apomorphine injection and whatever, depending upon the availability. So that is all I have from my end. Thank you for the patient listening. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your excellent presentation. And we have uh, really been benefited through your presentation. And thanks to all our participants who have been listening this thoroughly. Uh, so we have got a lot of questions from our participants in Facebook, also in Zoom session. So we'll be asking the question one by one. So that uh, a lot of questions, we may not take all the questions, but the important ones will be taken off. First question I'm going to ask, uh, this is to Adi Matan Priya, sir. Uh, sir, uh, in the lecture period, Dr. Yadav sir said that we should delay the onset of treatment as much as we can, uh, and we should be looking after the activities of daily life. So is there any indicator that we should uh, follow or we should uh, use to find out that is there any uh, disability or the hampering of activities of daily life present or not? Is there any tool or indicator that you can use? Sir, I have to unmute Sir, I have to unmute my for sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is very important issue when you should start on uh, treatment. Actually, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Parkinson's, they present with, uh, you know, several things, uh, tremor, uh, bradykinesia, uh, rigidity, and uh, loss of postural reflex. And at least two should be there, two or more should be there to call Parkinsonism. And as you know, there are different types of Parkinsonism. Actually, most of the medicine, as Dr. Yadav has mentioned, it works for uh, idiopathic Parkinsonism. Like a lot of times we see patients with uh, vascular Parkinsonism where when they have lower body Parkinsonism and there are secondary Parkinsonism because of NPH and others. First, you have to see what is the, as much as possible, you have to establish what type of Parkinsonism. And if it is idiopathic Parkinsonism, which is mostly unilateral and after, uh, I mean, if it is not hampering, if there is slight tremor and patient is not, having any problem with, uh, with his day-to-day -day work or uh, writing or doing something, then he should be left alone. And uh, I mean, if he's having some problem, bradykinesia or rigidity, which is hampering lifestyle, he, he can start. My experience in US and here is that in our country, uh, I see patients who present in the later stages. In US, I wish to see patients who present much earlier in earlier stages. So in US, what we are, I did my residency in 90s, mid 90s. At that time, we are using mostly salazelin uh, to uh, because once you start on carbidopa levodopa combination, you are bringing on those uh, side effects like motor fluctuations and uh, dyskinesias, as uh, Dr. Yadav had nicely mentioned. So you have, we have to uh, I mean buy time. So giving other medicine first, we can give 
uh, you know, MAUV inhibitors, and then we can go buy some time with amantadine. We should delay the use of, uh, I mean, uh, carbidopa, levodopa. And uh, as he mentioned nicely, I mean, uh, we can, uh, in younger people, we can give some uh, dopamine agonist drug. And we have to, but definitely carbidopa, levodopa is the best drug. And this is, it, it gives most symptomatic benefit. So, I mean, if a patient is not uh, having much problem with his walking balance and he can carry on, we, we should delay. But problem is in our country, you know, people want immediate benefit. They don't like to, uh, you know, so I mean, if you can explain, you can start with the minor medicine uh, because as, as uh, Dr. Yadav has mentioned, I mean, dopamine is, uh, I mean, uh, the um, uh, MAUV inhibitor, the sizzling is available in our country. It works either in the early stage or it can help in the uh, later on to decrease the motor fluctuation. So uh, with resazelin, with uh, dopamine agonist in younger people, we can buy time. And really when they are having problem, we can start on uh, carbidopa, levodopa. And MAUV inhibitor, uh, resazelin, uh, amantadine, maybe you can be, but if it is later on, say, later period, we can give the le levodopa, carbidopa. So anticholinergics, mostly it works for, and uh, I mean, tremor. And uh, so it will not work for bradykinesia or rigid, it's not as much. So, I mean, if the patient is uh, having really some problem, we can, uh, depending on the situation, we can, uh, I mean, start the treatment. If you can add Hello, something. Sir. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, we have got next question uh, to Praveen Kumar Yadav, sir. So, what are the indicator of response of park anti Parkinsonism drug? Amra sir, patient er kono kono jinish ta dekhe amra buste parbo je patient ta shole drug er response korte chhi korte na. The uh, response parameter, uh, see in uh, uh, good research institutes they use the UPDRS score, Unified Parkinson Disease Response Score. There is a score in which you are having various criteria and scores are there. So with that you can definitely find out. But in a busy OPD schedule it becomes very difficult to use the UPDRS score. So normally you can look for the improvement in the activities of daily living, how the patient is able to do and go about the daily living activities like buttoning, unbuttoning the shirt, going to the toilet, walking, having the food. How is the efficiency in that? Then you can uh, examine for the rigidity, the tremors and the gait and also the stability, uh, postural stability clinically and then find out the response. To give a, uh, uh, it will be better for uh, follow-up, if you are having the facility, you can do the UPDRS score, which has a composite score of everything. So that will give us an idea, like what was the last UPDRS score and whether it has gone down, whether it has come up. So with that, you can have a good idea. Thank you, sir. Usually, the medications are idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Usually, idiopathic Parkinson's disease is old age, after 60 sometimes. So, sir, you have experience in the world, sir. I mean, how many years of age you have faced the idiopathic Parkinsonism? Ali, sir. Sir, sir. I mean, sir, idiopathic Parkinsonism, how many years of age you have faced the present? Because we have seen the present in 16 years, sir. No, you know, they can present, mostly it is a disease of older people. They can present in 50s. 60s, 70s, but uh, in our country, I see people much younger than in the Western countries. In Western countries, they present much later, 60s, 70s. Or, uh, I mean, uh, in our country, I mean, there are some uh, juvenile on onset Parkinsonism, and it can present in earlier age also. Uh, 20s, uh, they can present 30s, 40s, but these are not as common. And some of the younger Parkinsonism, they have these uh, genes, abnormal genes. There are so many genes. Uh, so, which can present. So, one important thing is once they present in earlier age, the disease is more severe. The, uh, the later they present, the disease is more, uh, it progresses extremely slowly. We have to remember, you know, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease. The stage, there are several stages, stage one to stage five. One is uh, when it is unilateral, if it is both sides bilateral, it is stage two, three, once they need some help, stage four. When uh, two person help, they need for walking and balance. A stage five is when they become wheelchair bound. And uh, once, even in stage one, 70 to 80 percent dopaminergic cells are lost. Uh, so, and you are left with, uh, you can say maybe 20, 30 percent. 
So once somebody is symptomatic, definitely a lot of uh, dopaminergic cells are lost. There are other, uh, you know, neurotransmitter cells, uh, you know, serotonin, epinephrine, non-epinephrine, and others, but it's mostly the dopaminergic, especially in the substantia, uh, nigra, locus ceruleus, and others. So, and in Parkinson's plus syndrome, you have other systems which are also affected. So, I mean, the I have patients who, who presented in 30s by six, seven, uh, five, six years, they became stage uh, five wheelchair bound. So the earlier they start, the worse is the outcome of prognosis. If they pre uh, if they start after 60, 65, they can go up to, uh, you know, average is 12 to 15, even 20s, 20 years after diagnosis, 20 plus years, they can survive. So it is a neurodegenerative disease, definitely. And most of the patients, they uh, die from aspiration pneumonia. So, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, very slowly and they have this uh, motor complications and non-motor sign symptom, uh, that becomes also an issue. Uh, dhunobad, sir. Uh, next question is to Praveen Kumar, sir. Sir, as you have bolden, sir, your trihexafenidine, that is acetyl uh, trihexafenidine is the base drug for tremors, sir. And the patient uh, may develop cognitive impairment and sometimes, you know, other problem with like uh, delirium due to this medication. So, sir, if a patient develops cognitive impairment and the tremor is also there, then what would be the next drug that we should look into for the control of tremor? See, trihexyphenidyl, uh, more than 70 years of age, you should be extremely cautious when you are using trihexyphenidyl because yes, after sir. 70 years of age, most of them will have some cognitive issues, high chances of delirium, then there will be more chance of postural hypotension as well as benign prostatic hypertrophy if it's a male patient. So all these complications may increase with trihexyphenidyl. So if you are having an elderly patient with the tremors, amantadine, though it also has a chances of uh, uh, delirium and psychosis, it has less chance compared to that of trihexyphenidyl. So in that case, amantadine would be a better option if uh, you are having an elderly patient with cognitive issues and tremors. Can I add one thing? Can please I add? Sir, please, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are right. I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, medicines we use in dementia medicine, uh, anti-dementia medicine, basically there are four FDA-approved drugs, uh, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, and uh, I mean, rivastigmine, uh, then you have galantamine, and donapazil. These are all cholinesterase inhibitors. They, are, uh, they function, they increase the level of acetylcholine, which is uh, supposed to be decreased in case of dementia patient. We start with MCI and then it goes up. And there is another one, as you know, mementin, which is a glutamate antagonist. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, glutamate. So, in a, in anticholinergic drug, so you are trying to block the acetylcholine. And in dementia, with those three drugs, you are trying to increase the uh, acetylcholine. So, they are antagonistic uh, in one way. So, if you are using anticholinergic and the uh, cholinesterase inhibitor, uh, it doesn't work as much and older people as you said it can cause a lot of confusion so i what i mean the best drug to use uh, for dementia in uh, i mean uh, in parkinson's will be rivastigmine definitely you can use the others also but if it is moderate to severe dementia definitely amantadine sorry mementin can be used and mementin works in a different way so although it is used for moderate to severe dementia but i think uh, because it works in a different pathway. So I think that will be a good choice to use uh, anti-dementia mementin instead of the cholinergic inhibitors, uh, donapazil, uh, rivastigmine, and galantamine. In our country, galant galantamine is not available in Bangladesh. So I think mementin will be a good choice. I mean, uh, definitely, uh, I mean, uh, amantadine, and you can use one of the dementia medicine, mementin, because it is a different way. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Th thank you. Thanks for your response, sir. So, next question is that: Is there any black box side effect of any, any Parkinsonian medication, uh, Pravin, sir? Is there any black box side effect of any Parkinsonian medication? Yeah, black box warning is one is uh, for Pramipexol. They have given black box warning for impulse control disorder, and second Thanks. is uh, sleep attacks. So there may be sleep attacks while driving. So that may be a black box warning for uh, uh, this, and for myobi inhibitor. So uh, there is a black box warning for serotonergic syndrome. So you have to be careful regarding that. When you are using with tyramine containing food, so that has to be avoided. 
and uh, impulse control disorder and the stoppage of drugs dopamine dysregulation and all those things you have to be careful thank you sir yeah, uh, next can, question add, is uh, next if uh, i can sir. add something yes sir please sir yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have elaborated on the Parkinson's, but it's another thing we are, uh, you know, the uh, psych uh, psychotic symptoms or behavioral symptoms we get in Parkinson's patient, especially with the, as the disease progresses, we are using clozapine and uh, which can cause neutropenia and we are using now quetapine, uh, uh, Pima Venserin, actually that has not been available in our country, but that is better. Like in USA, I mean, Quetapin has also a black, black box warning. Pimbaserin is safer because it works in the selective inverse serotonin way. So, I mean, uh, Quetapin we are using don't have much choice in our country. Clozapin we don't use as much because of side effect. But that also carries a black box warning, uh, Quetapin. Uh, we have to be especially sudden death in cardiac problem uh, it can cause. Yeah, quetiapine is known to cause QT prolongation, so it can cause QT. cardiac issues. Cardiac problem. Mm -hmm. Similarly, clozapine can give rise to seizures. So, agranulocytosis Seizure and, and neutropenia. Yeah. Neutropenia. So, that has to be taken care of. Uh, so, one of our last question is that, sir, Ali Bakhtar here, sir. Uh, that, sir, we use the uh, medication, uh, the Parkinson's medication, which we have to do, sir. There is a medication side effect, like uh, hallucination, um, when a patient a consciousness level altered for this, so sir, Amadar Anushma Diki Jamra patient is a Parkinson's plus syndrome. Thak, and one of the Parkinson's plus is Leobody dementia. So, one patient Leobody dementia patient is a hallucination heart. So, it's a drug induced hallucination, or the patient is developing a Leobody dementia. So, I'm going to eat it. Yeah, this is a nice question. Interesting question. I mean, uh, Louis body is uh, basically. Uh, they have dementia and Parkinsonism. If you, uh, uh, I mean, Parkinson's patient also develop dementia. In Parkinson's patient, uh, they develop dementia in the later part of the disease. And Lewy bodies, they develop uh, along dementia and Parkinson together, or dementia can be earlier with followed by Parkinsonism. And uh, Lewy bodies dementia, they have certain features, uh, like they have REM sleep disorder, behavioral disturbance. Uh, they can have hypersensitivity to uh, neuroleptic drugs, uh, sleep disorder, so a lot of other problems. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes it is some, and uh, I mean, the behavioral hallucination, psychosis, these are more prominent in case of uh, Lewy bodies. Uh, but dementia, uh, normal Parkinsonism, this will happen in the later stage of the disease, maybe third, fourth uh, stage of the disease, not uh, in the earlier stage. So uh, and normally in Parkinson's, we are not using this uh, medicine. Uh, you know, quetapine and others. Uh, is another important. So, uh, I mean, sometimes and Lewy bodies, uh, dementia, I mean, patients, they can be, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, I mean, they can present in 60s, 50s, 60s, I mean, 60s, uh, much earlier. Peak disease also earlier, Lewy bodies, and it's not maybe early 60s or late 50s. Uh, they can present. So, uh, it, I mean, uh, in Parkinson's, uh, the hallucination, restlessness, all will develop later stage of the disease. But uh, Lewy bodies, it can present from the beginning. And sometimes it's very uh, rampant sleep disorder, hallucination, delusion, and hypersensitivity to this. And sometimes we have to be very careful giving this medicine. Another important thing is we should not use too much benzodiazepine in this kind of patient. We should avoid, you know, as you mentioned, melatonin is a good drug. Uh, we can use quetapine, uh, pimba, serine, and all this uh, to control the same. Sometimes it's become, it becomes challenging. And if somebody, uh, especially when they're in the hospital, sometimes we, we have to look into other reasons why they are confused. Looking into the metabolic causes, sepsis, whether they had new things. Uh, sometimes some other things can make them worse. So unless we find the primary cause, it is really challenging to, uh, I mean, uh, improve their symptoms. Even hyponatremia, UTI, or pneumonia, uh, or LA, uh, liver dysfunction, kidney disease, all this can, this. And we can have, they can also have some structural disease, like stroke, new stroke or something. So we have to find what led to this problem. Yes. So unless we find the primary problem, sometimes it becomes challenging. Thank you, sir. Can I add, sir, can I add one point? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. 
लेबी बॉडी डेमेंशिया दी क्लासिकल फीचर इज न्यूरोलेप्टिक हाइपरसेंसिटिविटी इफ यू गिव अ स्मॉल डोज ऑफ एंटीसाइकोटिक आल्सो दे विल रिएक्ट टू मच टू दैट डोज सो आई हैव सीन पेशेंट हैविंग हाफ डोज ऑफ क्विटेपिन एंड दे बिकम टोटली सेडेटेड फॉर 2 3 डेज इफ दे आर लेबी बॉडी डेमेंशिया सेकंड इज दे आर हैविंग अ फ्लक्चुएटिंग कोग्निशन सो समटाइम्स दे आर वेरी गुड समटाइम दे आर वेरी बैड थर्ड इज द साइकैट्रिक सिम्टम्स आर वेरी क्लासिकल साइकैट्रिक सिम्टम्स लाइक कैपग्रास सिंड्रोम सो दे दे सी दैट they are having some imposter somebody is replacing them so there will be some specific psychiatric uh, syndromes and hallucinations which occur in levy body while in psych parkinsonism it will be non specific hallucination so it not, may not be very formed and non specific like in schizophrenia you get uh, first person second person auditory running hallucination running commentary and all similarly in levy body it is a specific type of psychosis which occurs unlike uh, parkinson disease with psychosis which will be non specific and bizarre so that fits things may be helpful uh, thank you sir so we have got a lot of questions but due to time constraint we have to take one last question sir uh, to pravin kumar sir the question is that sir uh, parkinsonism is a diagnosis of clinical diagnosis actually so you said that apomorphine is a drug that can be given subcutaneously so sir apomorphine diye ki amra eta korte pari kina like response to apomorphine amader ki kono bhabe diagnosis e sahajjo korte pare kina whenever you are diagnosis or initiating a patient with treatment see there are two ways uh, one is the clinical diagnosis second is levodopa itself so if you are giving i have already told 300 to 600 is the standard dose of levodopa if you are giving a fairly good dose of levodopa that is 900 to 1000 mg and if yes. still the patient does not respond to the levodopa then it is highly unlikely the patient is having idiopathic parkinson disease now apomorphine is a toxic drug so once you give the apomorphine you have to give you have to keep the patient in observation and then monitor the blood pressure there may be cardiac issues angina chest pain and hypotension so if you are having the facilities apomorphine may also help in the diagnosis but the preferred drug would be levodopa so you can give a levodopa trial for 2 3 day uh, weeks with a standard dose of 600 mg to 900 mg and if the patient does not respond then that can be a suggestive feature that the patient is not having idiopathic parkinson disease uh thank you sir uh sir we have come to the end, uh, come to the end of our session sir shakti kotha bolte like as we are the young doctors and the juniors and the medical students who are watching everyone is getting benefit from our these sessions and everyone is participating enormously so prathame ichu pravin kumar sir ke bolbo sir is there any message that you want to pass to our young doctors so that we can take home and your practice so when you are seeing the patient of parkinsonism now first of all i would uh, congratulate the whole team of bd physicians and especially dr ehsan khan who is doing a wonderful job and every day you are having such amazing cmes so i think uh, bangladesh is lucky to have such group so that you can update yourself and i would also admit that i also uh, take part in most of the cmes like approach to jaundice anemia and such things because we are into super specialty practice so keeping in touch with whole of the internal medicine becomes very important so i think that's a great job and uh, that uh, bd physicians are doing and regarding parkinson disease i have um, uh, you have to approach the patient as a whole so it's not about uh, making the diagnosis and then feeling that okay i have diagnosed parkinson disease it's about managing the patient managing the patient as a whole to take uh, the motor symptoms the non motor symptoms the socio economic status and everything and then manage the patient and it is a multidisciplinary approach you cannot manage parkinson disease alone so you have to take the help of the uh, uh, you have to take the help of the physiotherapist the occupational therapist and in the later stage of the disease even the neurologist or the uh, movement disorder specialist depending on the requirement so you have to remember that it's a multidisciplinary approach and a uh, wholesome approach to the patient considering the motor the non motor and all other aspects of the patient so that you can uh, treat them wholesome in a wholesome manner uh thank you sir thank you very much for your precious time ekhon sir amra shorashori chole jabo amader ajker ei cmr jini chairperson dr ali mukhtar bhuya sir er kache to finish the session and give valuable talks uh thank you ali mukhtar bhuya uh, ji uh thank you uh, dr uh pravin kumar biyada for your nice uh, for your nice presentation actually it was very elaborate discussion on very important aspect of uh, parkinson's disease so you have nicely elaborated on the different medicine you started with the uh, different medicine anticholinergics uh, uh, 
uh, you know, amantadine and uh, levodopa, carbidopa, uh, dopamine agonist drugs. So, so many other things. And there are some rescue medicine you, which you nicely elaborated, um, especially the inhaled levodopa, uh, epomorphin pump, uh, rotigotin plants, which can be used in uh, when the disease become becomes severe. So actually, and you also uh, elaborated on the uh, surgical aspect, uh, DBS, uh, uh, duo pump, and uh, epomorphin, uh, I mean, uh, placement. So, and so these are the important aspects. And uh, one important aspect of uh, management of Parkinson's is also a rehabilitation therapy, which includes physical therapy, occupational therapy, space therapy, uh, because uh, this uh, disease also affects uh, different modalities. So uh, in a lot of uh, research has shown that if patients do a lot of uh, hard uh, strenuous exercise, also aerobic exercise, it also improves, uh, I mean, a kind of neuroprotective, uh, I mean, uh, function. Actually, there is no uh, cure for Parkinson's disease. Uh, there is no neuroprotective agent so far. They are trying different medicine. So, you know, other aspects is also uh, important. Um, and there are, these are the motor uh, management you have discussed nicely. You have also elaborated on the uh, non-motor uh, sign symptom and the management. Uh, ultimately, at the end of this uh, patients, they become uh, in the advanced stage of the disease, they become uh, bedridden and they have a lot of complications. They cannot uh, swallow food. Uh, once they are bedridden, they become, uh, they can develop uh, urinary incontinence. Uh, they can develop a bed sores. Uh, feeding becomes an issue, uh, NG tube, or they can need a PEC tube feeding. And end of care uh, also becomes an issue, whether they will uh, go, go into DNR, do not resuscitate order. In the Western country, they have a uh, system where they give uh, DNR. Uh, do not resist. In our country, in Bangladesh, we don't have DNR order. So, uh, and one after another, they de develop different types of complication and they have to come to the hospital with so many things. They can ha de have metabolic uh, issues, uh, infections, systemic infection, CNS infection, and other things. So, and finally, it becomes challenging for the families also to take care of these patients with these uh, patients who have become uh, ultimately bedridden and need a lot of nursing care. And in our country, nursing care is also a big issue. We don't have very well-developed nursing uh, care. And the families have to take care of this uh, end care uh, of this patient. So thank you for your nice uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I thank BD Physician also to give me this opportunity to uh, participate today. I'll be interested to participate in future. Uh, thank you all for your nice attention. And himself, so Dr. Nikul Hoxar. So we all invite you to attend that session and have a great knowledge on gout. After the Shabaki Dhunubadi, after the session, 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 session,